Jesus this morning. Yes, God. Amen. Can you give the Lord one hand clap of praise? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, God. Glory, glory. Amen. You can be seated this morning. And if you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to Psalms chapter 127. We're going to use a lot of Scripture this morning and hopefully cover a lot of ground. i got a lot to say that I believe the Lord's just placed on my heart. And I was just so excited about this. I just kind of work on things going throughout the week. And I write notes on newspapers and receipts and sticky notes and on the back of my hand. And sometimes I, I take pictures of my hand before I get in the shower because I don't want to wipe off what I... What I've wrote, I've had God wake me up in the middle of the night and tell me some things, and I'll say, I'll remember that in the morning. I get up in the morning, I can't remember what it was that He gave me that night, so I've learned you better write it down. My daddy taught me an old proverb that the weakest ink is better than the greatest memory, right? So write it down, write it down. I think I found a, a gray head on, hair on the side of my head yesterday, and I for sure saw one on top of my wife's head this morning. Uh, so I said, I don't know, most of the people in my family get to keep their hair, so if I can keep it, it don't matter too much what color it is. So no offense, brother. We love you, brother. <laughs> amen, amen. So Psalms chapter 127, I just if you're taking notes, you can write some of these Scriptures down, things down, and go back and look at it a little better at your own time. But we're, we'll read just one verse of Scripture and we'll, we'll get started with a message. Psalms 127 and verse 1, it says, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchman wakes in vain. We'll read it one more time. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keeps the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. And I want to preach a message this morning entitled, The House God Builds. The House God Builds. Will you pray with me? Father, we just thank You so much for Your Word this morning. Thank You for Your anointing. Thank You for Your Spirit, God. Thank You that You've been with us, Lord. You, you've lifted our hearts, Lord, this morning. And You've encouraged us, Lord. You've given us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, Lord. You've driven out oppression, Lord, and depression that would come by the powers of darkness and things that would come to hinder us from being. Lord, what You called us to be. Lord, we may have come in thirsty and dry, but You've allowed Your river to flow, God, to touch us, Lord. But don't let it just be wasted upon ourselves here this morning, Lord. But let it be, as Jesus said, out of our heart, out of our belly, our innermost being is going to come flowing rivers of living water. And You said that would be the Holy Ghost that would come after Jesus is glorified. And God, we thank You that we do have a glorified Christ this morning and the Holy Ghost is moving in this earth today to make Christ known, to preach this gospel, Lord, and to lift Jesus up high and make Him real in every heart and in every place. God, we see that You're building a house, Lord, and You don't build Your house out of mortar and brick and stone, but Lord, You make it out of people that have been born again and being made to be the habitation of God by the Spirit. Lord, we pray Your anointing today upon the reading, the preaching, the hearing of the Word of God. And let our hearts be prepared and open and good ground for You to sow Your seeds into, Lord. And let us come to be the people where Christ is glorified in and among. And we thank You for it today. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. You know, we, we've been at this thing a little over a year now. And just the, the burden of my heart when we started uh, planting the church and, and the burden that's still there today is to see the house of God built. And the, God's house, as we said a moment ago, it's, it's not made out of brick and, and mortar. It's not made out of programs 
or committees, but it but it's made out of people. It, it's built out of people that have been born again by the Spirit of God. They're, they're not what they used to be, but they've had an encounter in their life with Jesus Christ. And He's more than a song or more than a meeting on Sunday, but He's become everything. They've been saved and they're never going to get over it. They're, they're people that have, that have been filled by the, with, the, with the Holy Spirit. God has made them to be His temple and, and His dwelling place. And God lives inside of them. There are people that, that, are, that are growing, growing in the Lord. No, we're not perfect, but, but by the grace of God, we're not what we used to be. I hope that we're able to look at, at our life and say, you know, I, I'm not what I was a month ago or two months or six months ago. I, I, I may still be struggling with some things, but I can see God's hand working on my life and dealing with me and molding me and shape. That's what it means to be in Christ. It doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it does mean that you're growing and God is having His way in your life and you're, you're learning to say yes to Jesus and to, to surrender to Him in all aspects of your life. Salvation is not just your soul going to heaven when you die, but it's being redeemed from sin and from this world and even from your own self and, and coming into fellowship and union with God, a relationship with God by the Spirit, a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And in a relationship, we talk to each other, right? We listen to each other. We, 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 we come to know one another. And that's, that's what it has to be with Jesus. And in God's house, when you put people like that together, right? I, I think sometimes we just get beat up out in the world we get dried up and shriveled up in every little bit of, of, of the moving of the Spirit on Sunday. It just comes to have to fix our problems, right? And, and it's good. We ought to come, right? And, and bring our cares and needs that I know that if I can get to church, right? If church isn't my salvation, Jesus is my salvation, but where two or three do gather together in His name, He will be there, right? I didn't come to see you, even though I did. I come to see Jesus and I want to see Christ in you doing something in you working something out in you I know you got problems I know you got trouble know that I've got problems and I've got trouble but I ain't going to lay down in that misery pit and die I'm going to keep calling on Jesus he's a resurrection in the life I've been down for the count before and thought I'll never get up but Jesus says no you've come too far to quit and he'll put life back in me and he'll dust me off and put me back in the race and say, you don't know how close you are. You know, when I know growing up, we'd have to do some jobs that just weren't pleasant jobs that we didn't like doing and we'd get toward the end of it. My dad would say, we got her by the tail, boys. Right? We got her by the tail. We're, all, we, we're almost done. Home, home is just over the hill. We got her by the tail. Church, right? Home is just over the hill. That trumpet's going to sound. Jesus is going to come, we'll just wave this old world goodbye with all its sorrows and its care. I'm going to a place where they pave the streets in gold. I'm going to breathe the air that angels breathe and I'm going to get me a good place around that throne and I'm going to cry what those seraphims and cherubims have been crying for thousands of years. Holy, holy, holy. Oh, there's a, there's a group of people, uh, not people, but angels, something or another in heaven that for the last I don't know how long they've been around that throne crying holy, holy, holy and they try to leave or they try to get away but they're just captivated by the holiness and the awesomeness of God and they just say it again and again and again and God don't get tired of hearing it. God likes to hear His praises. God likes to see. But in God's house this is a house that's God's building right? Out of people like that. People that Jesus is working in. And you can see when, you know, a Pharisee has no Christ working in his life. He only has the outer coatings of religion. We looked at last week at how that Pharisee treated other people, right? He trusted in himself and despised others because he saw himself as righteous. That's
That's what religion does. It just casts. We don't want to build a religious house. God's house is not a, 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 a religious house. God's house is a hospital for the hurt and right. It's like an emergency room. It's like the, the last people are bleeding out. People are dying. Satan is robbing the life right out of people. And you just like you know if you're sick, the doctor's going to be able to help you if you can just get there to the doctor. It ought to be if I can just get to the house of God, right? If we could just get these people out here. I believe with all my heart, people shooting. I don't know what crystal meth is made out of. I hear it's made out of Drano and rat poison. And I just believe if a man will shoot that in his vein uh, just to get, just to feel something, just to feel alive, or just to get away from his sorrow and the failure and the shame that he... I believe that if that man's willing to do that, to feel something, that if he could encounter this Christ, this Jesus, the One who loved him and wash, wants to wash him from his sins, even in His own blood. Oh, I believe He'd say yes to this Jesus. The Bible says that the way of the sinner is hard. That's got to be a hard life, right? It's got to be a hard life living life without Jesus. And God's looking for a people that He can build a house where people like that can come. And we're not looking at them wondering, where where have you been? What have you been doing? What's wrong with you? No, we're saying, let me take my hand and I want to take you to Jesus, right? It's not come in and be like me or do what I do. Learn to say what I say. Just come and see Jesus, right? Just come and meet Him. Come and be in His presence. And in that place, the lost will be saved. The sick will be healed. The broken hearted will will be mended. Those that have bondages, they will be broken. Chains will fall off. Addicts will be set free by the power of God. You don't need to go to AA or 12 steps. You need to go to Calvary where the sin was paid for and the power of sin is broken. And you don't have to spend the rest of your life saying I'm an alcoholic or I'm a drug addict. No, you can say whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Right? Jesus can set you free. Jesus is the Deliverer. Jesus is the the mighty baptized or in the Holy Ghost in God's house orphans find a home in God's house where people that have been rejected and shunned they find acceptance with God in Christ Jesus and they find a family that loves them no matter what that we're not willing to quit don't you quit on me and I promise you I ain't going to quit on you right we might stumble a little bit on the way to get there but let's don't let's don't use one another as a stepping stone or a ladder to look taller or higher let's get up under just like soldiers in a battlefield one of us has been shot but two of us has still got good legs let's grab that brother or let's grab that sister and let's help them get across the, the finish line Let's don't shoot our own. Let's help them get our brothers and our sisters get to be where they need to be, right? And I just got a few points that I want to make. I'm not a point preacher. I just got this listed one, two, and three, so I'll hopefully not get off course too bad, right? (laughs) Miss Sister Marilyn, Miss Marilyn Bowen said, thank God it wasn't three points, right? (laughs) But anyway... uh, uh, in Psalms 127, we see a couple things that God must build His house and God must keep His house. Man tries to build it, it's not going to get built. You, you labor in vain. You labor. It means that by the work, it can't be done by the work of a man's hand. We can see all over America today where men are doing just that. It turns out to be a lot like the Tower of Babel. Remember that in the book of Genesis? They say we'll build us a tower to meet to get to heaven and get up there. You know, we're going to build something that will reach God. And, and it never did work. God said it isn't going to be like that. You're not going to build it. I'm going to build it, right? God has to build His house. And there's a move in the church today called a seeker sensitive 
sensitive move. Seeker sensitive simply means uh, that that it, it 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 it's it's sensitive to the one that comes in, right? And you don't know if you might have a Muslim or a Buddhist or you know a homosexual or whatever comes in. So we leave off all the absolutes and real gospel preaching and just present God to be a big teddy bear that loves everybody like they are. It, it dilutes the gospel, and that's how man builds his house because you can get a lot of people to come that you know this purpose driven church purpose driven life the Rick Warren and and they they built a church in California called Saddleback Church and I heard that when they were in the making of that church what they did was they went around town with 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 a little questionnaire and they knocked on the door and said sir do you go to church no I don't go to church why don't you go to church well the last time I went down to that church they you know they they preached about my tobacco or they preached about alcohol and it just made me uncomfortable and the preacher did everything he could to get me down to that altar to tell God how bad I was and when I finally got out of there I swore I ain't never going back well if if we left all those things off if we didn't talk about those things right well, then would you come to church well well maybe well I tell you what we promise you if we that we won't talk about things like that we just want you to come and, and be a part and you see things get bigger and bigger and bigger and things grow but the problem is people are in church but people aren't being changed because the water the gospel has been watered down and, and it's been diluted into something that just makes me feel good about myself. I want you to feel good about yourself, but only after you've been to Calvary, right? Only after, I promise you, if you'll come to Jesus, you will feel good about yourself because He'll take you and make something good. He'll, he'll take you and make a new, a new creation out of you. The gospel, the Word of God is a two-edged sword. It's not something you just swing it up other people and whack them down about their problems. No, it'll cut you yourself. It'll cut you. It'll cut all of us. It, it sees what's down on the inside of, uh, inside of us all. And it's, it's a good thing to preach repentance of sins because it, we're not measuring ourselves to one another. It's just the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why we need the Gospel, right? You'll call His name Jesus and He will save His people from their sins, right? That's the reason for Jesus is because not to be a little buddy that we meet on Sunday, but to be the Savior who turns our life around. And many times it takes a convicting message like that before we'll see. So God builds His house. And one of the things that we have to understand is not everybody's going to come because not everybody likes God's message, right? Right? Not, not everybody wants to hear that they're, that they're lost. And, and it's not just, a, it's our message to our own self. I'm lost without God. I'm a, I'll go to hell without Jesus, right? I need His blood. I need the sacrifice that He made. It's not a finger pointing to everybody. It's the gospel. Uh, I mean, just at other people, but this, this is pointed to everybody. It's directed at me. Every message that I preach, I want it to deal with me first, right? Paul said, you know, God forbid that I preach to other people and find my Myself to be a castaway, what good would it be if I just told you what you needed to do, but never let the Word of God deal with my own life, right? I want to put myself at the front of the line. I am the chief sinner. I need the most work. I need the Word of God not to come pat me on the back, but to cut me to pieces. God, show me what I really am. Don't leave me like this. Lord, but deal with me. Keep this heart soft and pliable. Make it real to me that I see how much I need you every day. I need you worse today than I did at any point in my life because I, I need Jesus. And I want to become more dependent upon Him as I go on in my life, in my, in my, in my walk with Him. So God builds the house. And God has to keep the house. Uh, in the book of Acts, uh, chapter, chapter 20, Paul met with the, the elders uh, of the church at, at Ephesus. Listen to this. And uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. And he tells them this. He says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers 
to feed the church of God, which He has purchased with His blood. Paul's telling the elders in this church to to take heed to that flock because the Holy Ghost has made us overseers. It's not that the Holy Ghost gave us the church. It's God's church. It's the church of Jesus Christ. But He does appoint men to be under shepherds to take care of that church, to guard it, to protect it, to oversee it, to feed them because He's purchased that church with His own blood. Verse 29, He says, For I know this, That after my departing, Paul says, after I leave, grievous wolves will enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Paul says, after I leave, those wolves are going to come. How does Paul know this? I have no doubt that God revealed it to him by the Spirit, but I also know that it was Paul's experience in the past. Do you remember? Maybe it was last week we ministered just a little from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, or Paul said you know that God put a thorn in his flesh to keep him from being lifted up in pride and he said the thorn in the flesh was the messenger of Satan to buffet me and I, I believe that, that that messenger of Satan was simply this it was when Paul would go and plant a church he would get it started get it going they're believing the right thing they're believing the right gospel but then he would leave and other men would come in men that looked good good they they didn't look like the devil they look like men of God and they would come and they would turn that church away from the gospel where they're not excited about Jesus and what he did at Calvary anymore they're excited about what kind of clothes that they wear and that they don't uh, do anything on the Sabbath and and they you know they don't eat pork and things like that and 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 they told they turn away and, and it goes on and people would write letters in Paul's name and accuse him of all sorts of things, wolves would come in, right? To tear that church apart. Verse 30, he says, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. This is even worse than before. Paul said, out of the middle of the church, out of your own midst, your own selves, people will arise to lead people away to themselves. Folks, that's what we're doing. Think about it. In everything, whether you would stand up and preach a message in a pulpit or not, but every conversation that you have with somebody, every phone call that you make, either you're leading people to Jesus, you're, you're leading people to become His disciple. A disciple means a follower and a learner. Either you're leading people that way or you're leading people to follow you, right? I, I know people personally that I don't even think they're saved but they, 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 they'll get like on Facebook and say some things about God and, and just, get a, just get a big following. And they're not a prophet of God, but they are a voice for this world. They are a voice for the devil to move people away and into just well, what, what I think, right? And what I think is no good. What does the Bible say And everything? You know, if we would sit around and listen to gossip and, and things like that and the tearing down of other people, then I am not doing my part in the body of Christ to lead people to Jesus, right? But I, I'm, you know, that's what the, the name Satan means is a slanderer and a, and a gossiper and an accuser. That's where he gets his name. That's what it means to accuse, to slander, to tear down. That's all he does day and night is point out your flaws, point out other people's flaws, and he just wants us to melt in a pile of, of, of condemnation, but the Bible says that true love covers a multitude of sin. It doesn't mean that we act like it doesn't exist, but it does mean that we're trying to bring one another to Jesus so that sin can be covered and removed so that it can be washed away and so that it's not exposed to the whole world. Aren't you glad that most of what God does in your life dealing with you, He does it behind the curtain, behind a closed door? How many of you would want everything that you've thought about or talked about or watched on TV or listened to to be on a projector for all of us to see here this morning? No, I'd I'd have to go. I don't want you to see that. 
But I'm thankful that what God does with me in my life, most of the time, He does it behind the curtain and He does it in a secret place. And when you see, if you could just see yourself for what you really are, the only way that you stand before God is because His Son was tortured and crucified and killed in your place. That's all. That's the only claim any of us have. He became my substitute and I must approach God on this level. On this level. I, don't have, I can't boast in any good thing I've done because all of my good deeds are just filthy rags before this holy God. You know, Job sitting in that ash heap listening to all of his friends talk about him and blame him and he would stand up to them a little bit and say, you know, I, I haven't done anything wrong. You're just accusing me. But when Job saw God, he said, I am vile. Right, I oh, I may do all right around my three knucklehead buddies, but when I see God, I see what I really am. Right, I got to put my head down because I'm not worthy to look upon somebody, somebody like that. And the only way that I approach God is because of what His Son has done for me. Right, and I see that God is able to look past all of my flaws and call me His Son because of the blood of Jesus. The Oh, I've failed a thousand times. He doesn't quit on me or tell me that I'm a hopeless case. He says, come, take what you need. I've got more. I'm going to get you. It doesn't matter how much you need. I'm committed to pay the price to get you across the, the finish line. And I see God doing that with me. How much more now am I inclined to treat my, my brother, my sister, my fellow man with grace, the same grace and love, Right? that God treats me with. So we're either making disciples of Christ or we're making disciples of our own self. Acts 20.31, he says, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul's in this church for three years warning them diligently of what's going to happen. The devil's going to come. He's going to give an attack. He's going to try to rip the thing apart. He's going to send messengers that look like the real deal. They look like ministers of light, ministers of righteousness, but their only uh, goal is to move you away from a pure and a simple faith in Jesus Christ. People of your own, of, in your own ranks, your own people that you love, and you know they're going to rise up and try to move Move you away from Christ and to themselves. But in verse 32, he says, Now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanct- sanctified. Paul says, I know the wolves are coming. I know that other pe- the hearts of men are going to turn. And you're going to see their true colors. This is what I'm going to commend you to God. Commend means to put into another's hand. Paul knows that whatever the church has got to go through, he can't stay there and protect it. God has to stay there and protect it. God has to stay. Whatever this church becomes, it doesn't matter. We do need to put our blood and sweat and tears in our prayer. We do need to go see people, witness the gospel, invite people, give those cards out, do everything that we can to get people to come. But in the end, what this church becomes is what God causes it to be, right? What 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 this church goes through if we go through it 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 must be and we survive it it must be by the grace of God not by the ability or intellect or programs of man he said I commend you to God commend means to put into another's hand in other words Paul says it's out of my hand it's in God's hand which is a good place to be he says into the word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. Men come, wolves come to tear down. God comes and the Word of God's grace 
Grace simply means you don't get what you deserve. Grace simply means God coming and doing in you and through you what you cannot do on your own. The Word of God's grace is the goodness of God that's available because of the sacrifice that Jesus made. And it's not available just to a select few. It's available to every man. The Bible says in Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men. It's available to all men, not just for the good people or for the people that I like, but every person that names the name of Jesus, I am called. You are called to treat that person with grace and to build them up, not tear them down. It doesn't take a whole lot to tear somebody down. And you don't ever know when somebody's just hanging by a thread anyway. And when it's all over with, you're going to have to live with it. Sometimes it's hard to hold things in. But I tell you what, it's a whole lot harder to take it back once you've let it out. And I believe part of being a mature Christian is sometimes we know the truth about people, but we also have to ask ourselves, is that person able to handle the truth? Because the truth without grace and without love, it's harsh. It'll hurt you. It'll hurt you. And sometimes we just have to hold things in. Sometimes I have to be like Jesus and lay my own life down. And let myself be a bridge. Let other people walk on me if they have to. Because if I stand up for myself or I stand up for my own rights or if I tell them what's really on my mind, it's going to build a wall and not a bridge. But because of Christ living in us and the Holy Ghost operating in us, we do have the ability to lay that self down. Lay that life. What are people seeing in your life? Is it you or is it Christ? You can't both live. I remember one of the first things Brother Robert told me, you know, is when, when I choose to live, Christ is on that cross. But when I choose to let Christ live in me, then it's me that's on the cross. And people are, people are seeing Christ. It must be. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. This isn't some weird thing, you know, some martyr thing where I nail myself to a cross or some just spooky spiritual thing. No, I live. I'm alive. I'm real. You can put your hands on me. I'm a real person. But it's not I, but it's Christ that lives in me. I, I believe that you could say if you would have met the Apostle Paul, to meet him was like meeting Jesus. The Bible tells us in the same chapter, in Acts chapter 20, that the elders of, of Ephesus, they come down there to meet Him and they wept. They cried because they did not want Him to leave. A man like that, you don't want Him. Oh, they love this man. People, love, pe pe people that knew Him, people that loved Jesus, they really loved this man. And so, God must keep His house. God keeps it by His grace. You know, it's an interesting thing. I am not getting as far along today as I wanted to. We'll do part two, part three, however many parts. But it's an interesting thing about grace. Grace has a... It's accused of a lot of things in church today. Some people, you start talking about grace. And religious people get angry and they get mad and they talk about greasy grace and... That's really a blasphemous thing to say because all they can see in grace is just a license to live any way that you want to. Some people have tried to make the, the grace of God that the Bible says in Jude, Jude verse 4 that men turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Lasciviousness, it just means a lifestyle without restraint. It means I do whatever I want to do when I want to do it and I just say grace covers it. That's not the grace of God. God's grace, you understand, is God coming and changing us. The Bible says in Titus chapter 2 and verse 12 that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness, to put off ungodliness. 
and worldly lust. It, it teaches us to put away ungodliness and the lust of this world and to live righteously and soberly in this present world. That means right now, in the middle, I don't know if the world's ever been as bad as it is right now. But right now, the only thing that can keep you and me from being a part of it is the grace of God. So God's grace is not something to look down on or shun. No, it's a life raft in an ocean where billions of people are drowned in in sin. God's grace is available not just because God is good, but because God was good enough to send Jesus. That's where grace comes from. Grace in Christ Jesus. To deliver me from sin and to teach me how to live. So a life that, that I just do whatever I want to do and I say that's grace. No, that, that's a lie. And I've took something great that God has and I've polluted it and turned it in to something else. And I'm only deceiving my own self. God's grace is that, that strength, that ability to deliver me from, from, from what I am and the nature of this flesh and to change it in, into something else. So, so, so that, that, that's what keeps grace, keeps the house of God. It builds us up, right? It builds us up. God's grace is constantly building us up. The house that God's built, it's a glad church. The Bible says in Psalms 122 and verse 1, David said, I was glad. When they said unto me, let us go unto the house of the Lord. David's a man that walks walks with the Lord day in and day out. And yes, he stumbled at times in his life, but he knows that he needs God. And he wants God. He wants God. He wants God more than he wants that throne. He he wants God more than he wants victory over his enemies. He he just wants God. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, and verse beginning in, in verse 42, it says, and, and this is about the 3,000 that were saved. It, it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking bread and prayers. And fear came on every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and their goods, and they parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily, one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, and ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. David said, I'm glad to go to the house. These people in the book of Acts, they were glad to be there. The Bible said they met in that temple every day. They received their their food with gladness, singleness of heart, and they praised God. God gave them favor with people. And every day God was adding to that church as many as as, as it should be saved. People, people were coming in. People were being healed. People were being saved. It was, a, it was such a stir going on in Jerusalem at this time. It wasn't in a little back corner somewhere. I believe it did start in an upper room with just a, just a, just a few people, right? At, what is that? 120 in that upper room. But they stayed and they made it to Pentecost. And people are getting saved. And, and the Bible says that they were glad. They were glad to be there. Let me tell you, Jesus is not boring. Religion is boring. Jesus is exciting. And he doesn't get wore out. If, if it's just a religious thing where I gotta go to church or I gotta do this or I might or I might not, that's a boring thing. I remember hating to go to church. I remember I couldn't wait to get out of there. I remember not seeing the point. I remember thinking, you know, that just driving, I think it was nine miles or eleven miles from the house 
It was too far. I mumbled and complained the whole time being there. But then I remember when Jesus became exciting in my life, we'd drive 75 miles one way and not think twice about it because Jesus was exciting in our life. And I couldn't wait to get to church. I couldn't wait to tell people about what God did. Maybe somebody called me a stupid idiot on the street corner. But I was just glad, right? I was just glad to be witnessing for Him. I was just glad to be serving God. Religion is boring, but but Jesus is so exciting. A relationship with Him is just so exciting that there's no telling what God might do in my life today. There's no telling the door that God might open up. Because when you're walking with Jesus, you're, you're living with that expectancy. Oh, I can't do miracles. I'm not a miracle worker. But I know somebody that can. I know somebody that does. Right? I really know somebody that does miracles. I really know somebody that's caused dead people to live. And He's healed sick bodies. And Oh, He's saved. He saved drug addicts. He saved drunks. He, he, he's, he's, he's took the worst of the worst. He's took people. Well, there ain't another spot on their body to put a tattoo. And they've killed. They don't even know how many people they've killed. They've been sentenced to life in prison. But He's met them there in that prison cell and He's made the greatest preachers of the Gospel that you've ever seen. He does that. And I get to walk with Him. He lives inside of me. And He's he's not just sitting in a corner scared. No, He's very bold. He's very robust. He's very eager. He looks at all the problems at this world and He's just chomping at the bit like a horse at a gate just wanting to get out because He knows that He has the answer. And His eyes roam to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for somebody that will just turn their heart towards Him and say, here I am God. Let my life be your house. Let this be your house. Let it be the temple of God. And He'll come. Walking with Him is exciting. You're looking for doors to open up. Somebody standing at a gas pump at a gas station looking at the ground. It's not just some, some guy that you don't know. No, that's a soul that's headed somewhere. And I don't know if he knows Jesus. But I got something. I got waters of life. I've got rivers of living water. Not a stagnant pond that dried up a long time ago. Not a creek that flows sometimes. It's seasonal. In, but a river of living water. And everything this river touches, it comes to life. No matter the situation, the river, what is the river? The river is the Holy Ghost that comes to lift up Christ in the earth. You are the temple of God. You're the vessel of the Holy Ghost. Can I tell you, God wants to fill you today. God wants to fill you to overflowing. Why? Just so I can speak in tongues? No, I believe that's part of it. And you need that, but it, in the early church, they didn't just sit around speaking in tongues and patting themselves on the back because they could do it, but they went everywhere and they preached Christ, and God worked with them, and He worked mighty signs and miracles and multiplied thousands of people. That's what the Holy Ghost is for. So people get saved. The result of Pentecost was 3,000 souls in one single day. Day. Living a life of expectancy when you're walking with Jesus. The Bible says in Acts chapter 3, they were on their way up to the temple there that day. And ain't no telling how many people went up there to the temple that day. And on the side of the road there, there's a little beggar man. He's lame in his feet. He's been lame for his mother's womb. There's a couple fellas. Old fishermen, they're headed up there. They've already, they're going to call them unlearned and ignorant men, but one thing they're going to know about these men is that they've been with Jesus. When they, when they talk, it reminds me of Jesus. When they open their mouth and speak, it reminds us of something that Jesus would have said. They learned their accent from Jesus. 
And they did what, in every place, they did what Jesus would have done if He would have been sitting there. They didn't sit around pouting and say, if Jesus was here, things would be different. No, He's with us. He's with us. Peter said to John, let's go to church. Jesus is with us. Oh, I just feel the leading of the Holy Ghost. We need to go to church today. We need to go to the temple today. They get up there, this little beggar man sitting there. He knows church folks are generous. That's what most of the church wants to do. Give you a little money. You're down on your luck. You're, you're down on this. You're down on that. He's, he's shaking that cup there. Would you please, mister, help me out a little bit. I, I need some food. I need something to eat. I need this. I, I need that. Peter said, I don't have any silver and I don't have any gold but such as I have I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ get up and walk and the man stood up and the Bible said that he began to jump he began to leap he began to shout he began to praise God and he went into that church with them and just messed the whole religious place up oh religion hated it so bad but God angels in heaven were rejoicing the Holy Ghost was rejoicing because Jesus was made more than words written in an old book somewhere. There's a man that was crippled and now he could walk. There's multitudes that were lost and now they're saved and they'll tell you, oh yes, Jesus is real. Jesus is alive. I'm telling you this. Jesus was exciting to that early church. They didn't need all this stuff, folks. They didn't need, you know, light shows. And they didn't need to be seeker sensitive. It was just if you've got a problem and you're looking for an answer, I know where you can find it. <laughs> I know where you can find it. And when you meet Him, you won't be the same anymore. He can be made real, folks. He can be made real in your life today. I want to read just this to you in closing. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14. You know this passage of Scripture. It said to the angel, the pastor of the church of the Laodiceans, right? These things, says the Amen, the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God. I just want to tell you that right there about the fourth, verse 14, the beginning of the creation of God. Jehovah's Witness will try to use that verse against you. And they think it means that He was the first thing that was created by God. <laughs> no, He's the beginning of the creation of God. He stepped out into nothing and made everything. He made all things. The Bible says that without Him, there was nothing made that was made. That's what that verse means. He's the beginning. He's where creation started. This Jesus, this Christ. He says, I know your works. That you aren't either cold or hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm, and neither cold or hot, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Because you say I'm rich and increase with goods and I don't need anything, and know it's not that thou art wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. He said, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you might be rich, and white raiment that you might be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness doesn't appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you might see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase it. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And he says this, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and I will sup with him and He with me. And to he that overcomes, I will grant to him to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in His throne. And he that has an ear, 
Let him hear what the Spirit says into the churches. The church at Laodicea, if you follow a timeline or a pattern, it's the last church age. It's the church that exists on the earth just before the return of Christ. And we can see that it's a church full of problems. You could preach for a month about the spiritual condition of this church that we just read about. They're blind, they're, they're lukewarm. And they have all of this stuff, but they're missing the most important thing. Something you can't have church without, and that's Jesus. And one of the things, I, I, I know I've told you this before, but just one of the things that amazes me about this passage of Scripture and just about the heart of God was I would think that the one who needs nothing, needs nothing. He don't need us. It's a privilege for us to be acquainted with Him. And He made everything that is. He would look at a situation like that. And it's not ignorance that people are doing this by. They know the truth. They did this themselves. He would look at a situation like that, and in his heart, it's not, I don't, you know, forget you, I don't need you, I don't want you, I'll go somewhere else. Because he's not desperate. (laughs) He's not desperate. But it's his heart towards humanity, it's his heart towards you and me. And the King of kings, the King of glory, owns the cattle on a thousand hills, stands outside of this self-righteous, horrible excuse for the church, and He knocks. And He says to him, He says, If any man hear My voice and open the door, I'll come to him. And I'll fellowship with Him. And He'll fellowship with me. And I'm going to make Him an overcomer. And I'm going to give Him a place in my throne. I'm going to give Him a place with my Father in heaven. I I believe that what's going to happen in the day and time that we live, I believe that the trend of Laodicea in church will, will continue as it is. I believe it will get worse. I believe just like today when you... You see things, maybe you you knew how things were, I don't know, maybe in the 60s, 70s, or 80s, and you see the way things are today, and you say, I can't believe they're doing that. It's going to be like that at church. I can't believe they would do that. I, I can't believe they're doing that. But all the while, people are having their ears and their hearts filled with all this stuff. You know, we, we don't need anything. We're rich and increase with goods. There's what the Bible calls a remnant. Remnant can be the leftover or the the remaining. And they're truly hungry and thirsty in their heart and in their spirit. And they're listening for the voice of God. Some of them are in places like this. Some of them are there because they're ignorant. Some people, ignorant just means they don't know any better. But they're looking for God. Sometimes you can get in trouble looking for God. You can, you can go look in the wrong places. And I know I have. I thought that was God and I went that way, but I, I was wrong. And you can get... But thank God the voice of that shepherd is calling out to his sheep, right? He's calling out to his people. And he says this, if anybody, anybody will come, open up that door and I'll come in. And I just want to tell you this. God's building His house. God's building His kingdom. One day it'll be a literal kingdom. And He'll he'll reign on a throne in Jerusalem. But right now He reigns in our hearts and in our lives. And I just believe, you know, in a place where Jesus is really reigning, He's really King. Oh, you ought to be able to see that, right? 
You ought to be able to know that. In the church, in the people that Christ is really being made real, really being made alive in, you ought to be able to see that. And I just wanted to ask this question, you know, is Christ being made real in your life? Just on a daily basis. We said in, in the beginning, you know, anybody can just make a show at church. And a lot of people want to do that. It's just a look at me type thing. But it's so much more than being seen or noticed or recognized. But it's day after day walking with Him. Letting God deal with you first. Put yourself and tell other people what they need to hear. But let God deal with you first. Let God deal with your heart. Because that's really the only power that you have is to keep putting your life in His hand. And God, make me what you desire for me to be. And I'll tell you what, if Christ is not being made real just in your life, He can't be made real through you at church. He can't. And that's what God wants to use you as. Building His house. His house is not just made out of one man or one woman. It's many people. Many people being, being molded, shaped, and fit together. And I know this. If I'm going to be a part of God's house, oh, I want to be the best part of that that I can be, right? I want to be the best part of that I can be. I want to let Him make me the part that I'm called to be. And just this, Jesus is at the door knocking. He wants to come in. I know most of you are, are saved. You know Jesus this morning. There's sure a lot of opportunity to grow. There's a lot of opportunity for, for me to grow, for you to grow. And we need to grow. I want to live a life that's exciting with Jesus. I don't want some old religion, some old religious thing. I want the door to be flung open wide. And I want Him to come in and have His liberty. Not that He just comes and visits every now and then, but He comes and stays and makes my heart at home. It's a lot of different than a visitor and somebody that dwells with you, somebody that lives with you, somebody that's at home with you. Lord, I want my heart to be Your home. I want my life to be Yours. And I want people to see me. Oh God, could it be said that when people met Peter and John and Paul and Timothy, that it was just like meeting you? And if that's true of those men, it can be true today that to meet one of us could be, no, we'll not Jesus and we'll never be, but we can bear His likeness and we can bear His image, we can bear His reflection in this earth. Wouldn't He stand out in this earth today? Wouldn't Jesus stand out in this earth today? Oh my God! What a contrast there would be. Oh God, come and have Your way in us. I'm just going to open up these altars this morning. I encourage you to come and pray and just spend some time with the Lord. You tell Him that the door of your heart is open and that you want Him to come in. You want people to see Christ in your life. You don't want a boring religion. But you want an exciting life where Jesus rules and dwells and reigns and leads. And I want to see the lost saved. I want to see the sick healed. And I want to see the bound freed. I want to see, oh God, I want to see a miracle working God in this earth today. Lord, I want people to see Jesus when they see.